Okay. Welcome everybody to Syndication Attorneys Free Monthly Podcast, uh, where we talk about topics of interest to real estate syndicators with opportunity to live uh, for live questions and answers at the end of the call. I am attorney Kim Lisa Taylor. Before we get started, please note that all of our podcasts will be recorded and may be used for future promotion, posted on our website or, or broadcast in a podcast available to the public. If you don't wish to have your voice recorded, please schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation instead of asking questions during the live call. Uh, we will. You can either ask questions by uh, raising your hand if you want to ask a live question, or you can uh, put questions into the Q&A section. Um, usually we're going to have a discussion for 30, 40 minutes with our guest speakers, and then we're going to go to the live Q&A, and uh, we will end right at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, information discussed during this free podcast is of a general educational nature and should not be construed as legal advice. Additionally, the views expressed are uh, today are not the views uh, personally of our guest speakers, Joseph Harriman or Mark Pertel, nor of their company, Chicago Trading Company or any of its affiliates. So just, uh, you know, we're all here just to uh, give you some education, give you some introductions. If you want to do follow-ups, you can do one-on-one -on -one calls with us or one-on-one -on -one calls with them. We'll make sure that you have their contact information at the time. Um, so today, our topic again is capital raising and co-investing with fund managers, Mark Pertel and Joseph Harriman. Uh, Joe and Mark, thank you. Welcome to our call, to our podcast. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Have you. Um, all right. So I'm going to ask you uh, just a series of questions. I'm going to try to flesh them out a little bit for our audience. Um, but um, tell us about yourselves and a little bit about your fund and its objectives. Sure. Yeah, I'll start. So my name is Joe Harriman. I've uh, been in finance for over 25 years. I've been with CTC for uh, just over 16 years in uh, trading operations. Um, we started a real estate company about six years ago, which I am CEO of. Uh, we just finished raising our fourth fund, which we closed last November. Uh, we raised about $100 million in equity to invest in multifamily, uh, primarily focused on the GP side of the capital stack uh, and primarily in, in value-add deals. Uh, we do have discretion in our funds to go outside that box. So we have invested in some development, some student housing, some self-storage, but uh, we're primarily focused on value-add multifamily. Um, yeah, Mark, do you want to give your background? Sure, I've been I've been with the company for 22 years, bulk of it on the trading side, but as the real estate side developed, I made the transition over there. I'm currently head of uh, acquisitions and development, and, uh, and Joe and I are, are the day to day guys on the on the team here. Uh, we we definitely look forward to working with different operators uh, on all aspects of multifamily. So um, that's that's in a nutshell what we're doing here. So. Usually, so would you consider yourselves a private equity company then? Yeah, pretty much. We're, yeah, we run a series of closed end funds, uh, capital commitment schedule. So, uh, you know, typically a three year investment period we have to invest our funds, approximately a 10 year life on, on the total fund. So, um, you know, again, looking at value add, typically we, we like to, the whole periods for the underlying investments like to be in that three to seven year time frame. Um, yeah, Mark, do you have anything to add to that? No, that's that's the general strategy. Uh, all these funds very much are, are mirrors of each other, just as different vintages, but um, it's it's a very much a rinse and repeat cycle because we have something that works and we like to grow with it. So the investment period, just for people who aren't familiar with the funds, is uh, and and you can correct me if I'm wrong about the way the way that yours is set up. But when we set up a fund, we'll set up an investment period during which time uh, the uh, the fund managers can raise money and then can also make investments. Is that kind of how yours works? Correct. Yeah, we we have we I guess have the luxury of having just one close, so you can't have multiple closes within your investment period to raise more capital. We had a target raise uh, in this fund of 40 to 50 million and we, we achieved it in our first close. So we basically closed November 1st and now we have this uh, three-year investment period to, to invest those funds. 
Wow, that's amazing. All right. And so then uh, just to clarify again for the audience, so you've got this three-year investment period during which you can meet operators, you can make investments in co-invest with other people, other syndicators. Uh, and then uh, you like to see projects that have a three to seven year hold and uh, so that your fund has a 10 year lifespan, basically. Right. So everything's liquidated and pay, everybody's paid back and they've all gotten all their returns within that 10 year life uh, span. OK, great. Um, typical fund. That's very typical of the ones that we also write. We didn't write this particular fund. We did do some uh, marketing materials for uh, for their fund. Um, but uh you know, we're always happy to participate any way we can. And that's how we met these guys. So they're, they're great guys. Um, all right. So tell me what you specifically look for in operator experience. Sure. Uh, so the way we structure these deals is a co-GP. Um, so we come in, we provide uh, the bulk of the GP capital in a deal uh, that allows the operator to go out and source a larger institutional type LP you know, providing 85 to 90% of the total equity in the deal. Um, a lot of our operators that we work with are either doing smaller deals with their own capital, they're a commercial broker who perhaps wants to get into running and operating their own deals, maybe a property manager, anybody who's had experience with syndications uh, and underwriting or raising equity or working with a shop of that nature. And then, of course, operators who, who are in the in the market right now who are doing deals, raising money, are just looking to scale up to do uh, more of a larger institutional type product. Uh, and that's where we step in. And so really, we're open to talking with operators. And, and just to be clear, um, a lot of our deals, well, pretty much all of our deals are working with operators. Uh, we need that operator who's going to go out and source the property, who's going to run the property. We understand our role and know our role is to be equity and balance sheet. And that's where we, what service we provide to operators. And so when you're providing the balance sheet, then you're also helping uh, qualify for the loan? That's correct. We, we will sign on, on a non-recourse debt and we use our fund as the, as the signer due to its liquidity and net worth. Nice. Nice. So, uh, yeah, for any of you out there, you know, they're they're calling operators, you, you know, typically these would be our syndication clients. You're expecting them to bring in 10 to 15 percent or more of the equity, right? Is that correct? Well, we'll we'll provide up to 95 percent of the GP equity. And OK. The operator will bring in that balance up to, say, 10 percent and then the equity, uh, the bulk of it comes from the institutional LP. So, you know. Grand scheme of things, an operator can contribute a half to one percent of the total equity and still be very much involved in a large deal. And then, um, so you said that some of the asset classes you're looking at um, uh, multifamily, you've done some student housing, some development projects. Uh, any other types of projects that you do, like self storage or um, other things? Yeah, the, the benefit of, of kind of the way we're structured uh, is we have the flexibility to really look at anything. Um, we have uh, a 20% kind of carve out for non multifamily investing in our fund. Uh, but, but our target and our, our kind of primary objective is workforce multifamily. So, um, you know, we kind of look at any region in the country. Uh, we, we don't have, we're just trying to build a diversified portfolio for our investors. Uh, we we do avoid some states like California. We we tend to avoid uh, just because of some of the complications there with investing. Um, but we're pretty much open to, to any, looking at any region. We do focus on uh, the secondary tertiary markets more than the primary markets. Uh, so we you know look at like in the Midwest, we'll look at uh, Iowa, Kansas City. You know, for example, of, of our historic investments, um, we've invested in Phoenix and kind of the entire Sun Belt. Uh, so, but really open to any region. And what kind of returns does your fund typically look for? We'll look at any project with, a, let's say, a five-year hold of a project level of 15% IRR. That's kind of a base case. Hey, let's, let's, let's take a look at it. Let's dive into it. Let's see if we like <laughs> Uh, we really encourage any operator to bring us a deal. Let us say no, as opposed to assuming that we're not interested. 
especially in, in the multifamily sector, we can get kind of creative. Uh, we do have a hotel conversion project on, undergoing in our previous fund right now. So it doesn't have to be the, the standard kitchen bath remodel and uh, change the management company. We, we can get creative with our, with our deals. And so when you're saying you're looking for a 15% IRR, is that what's going to come back to your fund or are you looking for that for the overall project? We that's kind of the, the floor for the project level. Um, because when you when we try to avoid talking about terms of the deal before we see the deal, because it just tends to complicate some things. So project level 15% IRR, yeah, we're happy to dive into it. Okay. Right. Some of those deals may be out there. Um and then what size deals, like what's going to be the minimum investment that you would even want to consider? Yeah, in this fund, we're, we're looking to invest usually two to six million dollars per investment. Um, again, it's not uh, we don't want to over concentrate the fund. So we do kind of try to be below, you know, that six million ish mark. But we we can go lower than two million. We're, we're pretty flexible on that. We're just trying to, you know, have our total fund be diversified with. Uh, a reasonable bond investments, not, you know. Um, so you don't want to go out and do $20 million investments? Is it? Don't want to do that. And we don't want to do, you know, 40, $1 million investments. We want to kind of. And then go. is there a specific, is it more about the price of the project or are you looking for certain, I don't know, like sizes? Like, does it have to be 15 units or 30 units or something like that? Or be, be the smallest project we'll, we'll look at. Uh, Roughly around five million dollars project cost. At that case, um, it's it's big enough where we can get down to that check size in there that makes sense for the economics. But more importantly, you start to get economies of scale um, in the project. Even even five million dollar deals are a little on the smaller side, but that would be kind of the lowest we go. Probably in most of our deals are are north of ten million dollars, ten to thirty million dollars. But we have done bigger. And then is it a criteria that you're going to put in 95% of what the GP is putting in or, or would you consider putting in less if it wasn't needed? Oh, we, we absolutely do less in our experience. Many operators, though, they want to put as little money in the projects as possible because they want to do as many projects as they can. So uh, we'd be very happy to take a look at the project to require a smaller GP capital uh, slice. And we can also be flexible, too, on that uh, the 10% because some LPs require the GP to put in 15% or 20%. So we can, we can fluctuate on there, but typically they're 90 ton structures. Mm -hmm. And then, so you're saying that the rest of the equity is going to be coming from the lender, right? And then other institutional investors or? Uh, currently in today's environment, it's going to be the total project cost we funded roughly 60% debt and 40% or so equity. Mm -hmm. with with about 90% of that. So 36% coming from the LP and then 4% from the GP, uh, JP. And then the LP equity, is the, are you guys participating in that or helping to find that or? We, we usually don't. The operators source that either through their own network or through uh, some type of assistance with a broker. Okay. So for everybody on the call, you're still going to have to raise money. <laughs> Bottom line, we can help you with the GP. We can help you with the balance sheet. That's so those are important jobs, uh, but you've got to bring in your own investors. They're not going to raise the money for you. And, uh, you know, they'll help you get the debt because that balance sheet is going to be hugely important. Um, okay. And then, um, so how are you structuring your deals with operators? You know, I, I, there's a variety of ways that people can do this. They can do it as prep equity. They can do it as a joint venture. They can do it with side letters. Uh, you know, what's your preferred structure? Yeah, we uh, typically structure a joint venture with the operator, which forms a company. And then that joint venture forms another joint venture with uh, a limited partner. So at the end of the day, you have this new company comprising of the three parties, uh, two joint ventures in total, and they buy the, the property. Um, and, and we're not blind. We understand uh, the LP is contributing 85, 90% of the total equity. They're going to drive the ship in terms of major decisions. They're going to say when to, when to sell. They're going to say when to refinance. And so we definitely respect them, uh, given that they are a large equity in the deal. So uh, we work with them on that. Uh, 
And then at the same point too, we look at operators to be a key component of this deal too. We look at them to be experts in their markets. We look at them to know what the pace of renovation is and how to manage the property. So everybody plays a role in our deals and, and we definitely try not to step on anyone's toes in that regard. Uh, to your question on PREF equity, uh, we are not PREF equity. Uh, all of our dollars sit in the same risk bucket as the operator and the LP. Our capital structure is very simple. It, in all of our deals, it's debt and equity. That's it. Um, so we, so like I said, we're not prep equity, nor do we want to see it in our deals. Got it. Okay. Something that everybody needs to be aware of is the, yeah, the, this is a, a tremendous tool to be part of your GP capital stack, but again, they're not going to take the place of the LP, uh, or the, uh, but, but you would have no problem with, uh, or I guess, let me ask, would you have a problem with an operator? So you do this uh, JV at the management level, right? And then they go out, what if they're, do they have to raise money from one LP or can they raise money from 60 LPs? It, yeah, it can, it can vary. We, we're pretty much indifferent on the LP. I mean, we, we want to work with the LP that makes sense for the deal. You know, if, if the, the business plan dictates that it's better to exit in three years and you have an LP wants to come in and hold it for 20 years, then that might not work. So it, you have to kind of look at the business objectives of the underlying property and sort of align your LP or LP, uh, you know, capital stack with what is, you know, what makes sense for the deal. So we're pretty flexible on that, but it, it also has to align with, you know, the overall goal. So just thinking of how this would fit into the structure with most of our clients is that you would be a, a, a member of the management entity of a syndicate and then they would be creating a syndicate that would either have one or you know however many uh members investors class a members we, we usually split it in a class a class b so they're the operator is going to be looking for those class a members whether they be one investor or be 20 or 30 investors in order to make up that uh the limited partnership or the uh, um the actual passive investment portion of the deal and then, uh, then the other portion of the capital stack, of course, is the uh, institutional debt that you're getting on that property. And, and uh, as you guys mentioned before, that has to be non-recourse. So they're not going to participate with anybody who has uh, a recourse debt uh, in, in their capital stack. And that makes sense. Um, okay, so you are co-guaranteeing loans with operators on non-recourse debt. Um, you guys have a $40 million fund. Is it already partially deployed or uh, you just still have kind of a wide open slate? It's, it's wide open right now. We're, uh, we're, we're looking at deals. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, been a more difficult environment over the last, uh, several months to, to transact. So we're, we're being patient. We're, we're, you know, looking at the market, um, and just trying to, you know, wait for the right deal to come along, but we're, we continue to look at many deals a day, so. Okay, and how long does it take you guys to make a decision? We move we move pretty quick relative to some other groups out there. So we've heard uh, that Joe and I have been many points of contact. Uh, we have an investment committee above us that has a uh, final say over of all, all our deals that we do. Uh, but, you know, if we see a deal we like, we move quick and, you know, we can have uh, funding and deal kind of locked up within three or four weeks. Great. Uh, all right. So you got to get these guys in early. You can't, you know, show them a deal that's a, a week away from closing. That's not going to work for them. Right. <laughs> it doesn't really work for anybody, including we like, us. We feel like we move fast relative to some larger institutions. Um, but yeah, we have, we need a little bit longer than a week. So, so the, the way that I can see this working for our, our clients would be that they would talk to you, develop a relationship with you, make sure that they meet either they already meet your criteria or they bring people onto their team that meets your operational experience criteria. And, uh, you know, you guys strike up your relationship, then uh, they go out and the operator goes out, finds the deal, comes to us. Uh, we can either help draft that management operating agreement with you guys as a, uh, the partners, or you may have your own council that does that. And then we could create that syndicate so that you would 
be able to, as an operator, go out and raise the additional money that's needed to fill the gap between the loan and what uh, um, Mark and Joe's fund is providing. Can you give us the name of your fund? I don't think we ever uh, actually established that up front. Sure, it's, it's Real Estate Opportunities Fund 4 is the name of the fund. Uh, CTC Wealth Management is the investment manager. Um, <clears throat> all right. And um, so how do you participate as a member of the GP who's putting up a balance sheet, putting up some GP funds? How active are you two in you know, overseeing the operations of the project and conversing with the GP? How does that look? Yeah, usually uh, once the deal's closed, we we take a role of somewhat of a, of a depending on where they are with the LP spectrum, we're, we're taking a role of, hey, we want to see quarterly reports. We might have a phone call periodically once a month, maybe once a quarter, depending on how the project's going. And uh, and from there, we we just, you know, let the project grow. Um, you know, we, we want to see the operators hitting their performer numbers. Um, and if they're doing that and, and staying staying on top of the property, we're relatively hands off in that regard. Obviously, if things uh, things start to go a little sideways, we're going to get a little more involved. But uh, generally, we, we trust the operator and to run the project. And do you retain in your management operating agreement some kind of a takeover right in the event that something were to happen to the operator or they just weren't able to perform? Yeah, we typically have that clause in, in all of our agreements. Just mm -hmm. And would the operator also uh, co-guarantee that loan in, in most of your deals? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, it just depends on the operator and the property and the, and the project. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what other, uh, do you, any other things that you want to talk about in relation to your fund or anything like that? And then I want to change tactics and talk about your money raising strategies. One other note too, with when an operator has a property, the whole thing doesn't have to be buttoned off through due diligence and ready to be wrapped up. Um, we're happy to talk to an operator even before uh, they've walked the property. Just, you know, hey, this property looks interesting. Your group might like it. They send it over to us. We can size up the area. We can size up the property type and give some, you know, near immediate feedback on that project. Uh, that way the operator kind of knows where they stand with us. And if, if it works, great. We'll go to the next step with them. If not, at least they know that we're, we're not a viable option. So, you know, we're welcome to talk with anybody pre-PSA, post-PSA, um, and if needed, we'll, you know, if the operator feels the need, we'll sign in uh, a confidential agreement if needed. And so pre-PSA, would you want them to at least have a, a signed letter of intent, or are you interested in looking at deals before they even have gotten that far? It, as, long, as long as the operator is transparent with us where they're at in the process, it lets us, us know how much time to put on the project. Obviously, obviously, if they're through due diligence or in due diligence, okay, this thing has a lot greater chance of actually closing. Where if it's, hey, this one just hit the market, we're going to walk through it. You know, does, does CTC care about this one? Okay, we'll, well, we can judge accordingly and respond. Yeah, but but just for the benefit of the attendees on the call, I you know I don't think you should be sending them stuff off LoopNet, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> you, you really need to be uh, you know, pretty serious about the project, and you've got more than just in you know uh, seeing it on the internet uh, and and a better connection. Um, you know, we we usually say the time to hire us, and and I'm sure you're going to get involved even earlier than that. But the time to hire us is uh, when you have a signed purchase agreement, uh, someone from your team has physically visited the site and you've reviewed the financials. <clears throat> you know, And if you can get the financials early uh, before you've uh, spent any money on the PSA or, or gone to the site, that's ideal, but sometimes the brokers won't release that information until there is a purchase agreement. So you've got to get those three things done. And then our statistics actually show that when our clients do that, uh, then they're 85% likely to close on their deals. <clears throat> So, so uh, yeah, we, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, you guys don't burn bridges here, you know, make sure if you're talking to Joe and Mark, you've got a viable deal. And uh, it's something that, uh, you know, more than just uh, something you saw on the internet. It, you know, and, and uh, you know, I suppose that happens, right, where somebody sends you a deal that you've already looked at with somebody else. Has that ever happened? It, it absolutely happened. It's happened. And, you know, at the same time, too, we get it's a competitive landscape, and it's going to happen. So you know, we, we get it. We're happy to talk them through with it, yeah. 
Okay. All right. So I know that there's a lot of our listeners on this call that are interested in setting up their own funds. And of course, all of them are interested in raising money. Um, so I'd just like to ask you guys some maybe logistics about your fund and some of your fundraising techniques that have worked for you and maybe some tips uh, that you'd like to share with our audience. Uh, I think that could be really helpful. Do you guys mind? Sure. Okay, great. Um, for, first of all, state the obvious, raising equity is very hard. Um, you know, we're, for our perspective, we're raising investing out of our fourth vehicle, investment vehicle here, which means we've had three previous funds. Um, these have exits, they have a track record, and our business model is very similar from fund to fund. So we have a network of investors who, who some of which have been with us from our first offering. And, uh, and so we have a level of trust that's been built up there and, uh, and they understand the model and it's, it's, it's very comforting for them and for us that knowing that they can count on us to deliver and, and likewise. So uh, this is contrasting with a single property offering where uh, operator can go out and give the offering out and then there's pictures of the property uh, the, or the investor can drive the area they can touch the building they can they can even rent a unit if they want in that property um, so it's, it's a much more uh, engaging process with the property and the investor and the operator uh, what we're doing here is it's known as a blind pool offering and it's much more difficult because uh, the investor basically gets a stack of papers that says the manager is going to do their best to find good deals in the future and hopefully generate positive returns and sign these papers and that's all you get. So there is a much higher level of trust which needs to be established between the investor and the manager uh, when raising a blind pool offering. So that's it, that's one of the big differences between the single property and, and a fund. And it's it's not very easy just to jump from you know, uh, going from not only property into a blind pool offering without some type of intermediary step to build up your investor base and trust with your, your investors. Yeah, and uh, you're mirroring the things that I tell my clients all the time. A blind pool fund, you know, there, there's people that will tell you, well, why don't you just raise all the money for your deals in advance? It's a lot easier than raising after you get deals under contract, but it's actually not. It's, it's much, much harder. Uh, a lot of uh, investors will sit on the sidelines until you get deals under contract anyway. Um, you know, as, as you said, you're raising money based on a business plan. That you know, says, here's what we're looking for. Here's the criteria. Here's the geographic areas. Here's the kind of operators. Here, you know, you're just you're spelling out if we can find things that meet this criteria, then we might buy them, you know, but there's no guarantee that you're going to buy anything. Um, so, yeah, a fund is hard and you don't want to attempt it until you have a track record of doing specified offerings uh, first. And, you know, that's like four or five completed deals usually is going to be enough to attract the, uh, investor interest. Um, but we've also had some clients that have tried to do funds and uh, after they've done, you know, many, many, many tens of deals and uh, their investors just didn't like it, they preferred the specified offering model. So you, it's, it's always uh, interesting to see how that evolves. But uh, yeah, funds are hard. What about, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the history of your past funds. Uh, so did you start out, was your first fund a $40 million fund? No, it was, it was smaller. It was uh, around 20 million. Um, really, yeah, uh, funded by s some individual high net worth investors um, associated with CTC. And it's really a, a, a method, you know, our, our biggest selling point is we can build a diversified portfolio in an asset class that's uncorrelated to other markets. So, you know, that's kind of how we started. Uh, we had a, a, a couple um, operators that we had established relationship with. So we had sort of a, a business plan in place with operators that, that were trusted. Uh, and that and the trust part is very important to us. So uh, having that established relationship really kicked off the first fund uh, really well. So that's how and we started. Did you increase the second fund? Was it a bigger fund or just kind of repeat the same thing over? That was about the same size. Uh, the, the first three funds, we really ramped up in this last offering uh, and we have, you know, big plans to continue the growth of the real estate arm here. And, uh, you know, our, our next fund, we hope to be a lot larger and we're going to continue kind of with the same philosophy as we build out our, our relationships, uh, our operator relationships, you know, 
trustworthy relationships that are important. And, and how are you building those relationships? Where are you meeting people and how are you, uh, you know, developing the relationship and staying in touch? A lot of it is a lot of repeat investors. And so, and then it's, it's referrals and it's, um, and, and so our, our net, our investor base is growing from the first fund, the current fund. Um, and it's, it, it takes time. Um, and, uh, and just want to just want to go on record here that we are not raising money right now for an, uh, an offering, and and at this time we are we don't have any plans for another offering. So we're not taking on new investors right now. Right, but you are looking for operators. Operators, <laughs> reach out to us. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and is this particular fund uh, just just again talking about the fund mechanics for someone who might want to try a, a similar fund on their own? Is is this particular fund a 506B or a 506C? Well, this one's a 506B. So um, step on your toes a little bit here, Kim, and say you cannot solicit with a 506B offering. And then there's um, a carve out there that you can have non-accredited investors in a 506B. Mm -hmm. how'd, I, how'd I do? Did I do okay there? You did okay. Yeah, that's right. And you took the time to develop the relationship, have suitability conversations with all of your investors prior to showing them your fund docs and uh, telling them about this particular fund. Um, so, uh, and uh, all right. So out of curiosity, this is your fourth fund. How long did it take you to raise the money for this fund? Uh, we, it was relatively quick with our, kind of like we talked about our, our Current stable of investors. Um, we had a, about a four or five month process of doing some roadshows, some webinars, um, you know, updating everybody on where we're at with our previous funds and kind of going over the, the, the strategy in the fourth. And uh, yeah, just having a lot of one on one conversations. So I'd say it was relatively quick, um, but I don't know that that's it, it worked out well for us. This, and, and did it take less time to raise a commensurate amount of money for this fund than it did for your first three funds? No, I, it, it took it took more time. Uh, we ex really expanded our uh, our investor base on this fund, so we we did take some more time to do more education. Okay, and if you don't mind sharing with us, just you know, approximately how many investors are in this forty million dollar fund. We're just over a hundred. A hundred investors. Okay. Um, and do you find that people that have invested with you before invest more or, you know, like people that are coming in first time that never invested with you before, do they tend to invest the, the least the amount they can or how does that work? I think it, it depends. It's very investor dependent on how much exposure they have to real estate. Um, you know, typically we get, kind of an increased allocation, uh, but it, it really depends on their kind of personal investment situation. Um, yeah. About how many investors do you think you have in your database? It would be, it's, it's a multiple of, of, of the hundred or so. Several hundred. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, and, you know, one thing to add too is when talking with investors, um, you, you're talking with people who have ranges of experience. So uh, us, us as the manager of the fund, we need to be in a position to be able to answer uh, very basic questions as well as very advanced questions. So it's, it's imperative to understand, you know, the, the, your business model, your, your fund docs, and, and as well as be able to, to respond to questions. Because if, uh, if you can't provide an answer to an investor uh, in the first meeting, well, there, there probably won't be a second meeting. Right, right. And you said you went on a roadshow. So was this the roadshow really to just uh, introduce the fund to people that you'd already vetted? Or was it to just talk about your company in general to new people? Uh, it was people we already pre-qualified. So it was really more of, you know, knowing that they were eligible to invest and then educating them on what we were doing. So that, that, that was kind of our process. Okay, great. Um, and any other tips that you would offer to people who are thinking about doing a fund or you know, just fundraising in general, even for a specified offering? Uh, I, I would kind of go with 
add on to what Mark said about it just being it taking a long time, especially with investors. The due diligence process, especially if you get to the institutional level, takes a very long time. So you really need to start a lot earlier than you even think you need to start. That's that's my main tip. And do you guys have other institutional investors that you've worked with as LPs that are kind of like, hey, if you get into any more funds, let you know, you know offerings, let us know. Uh, you know, do, can you help facil facilitate those introductions? We we have, we've started to look into that process, but we haven't expanded enough to to, to really say that we're we're at that point yet. Okay. Um, one one other thing too uh, to add on to Joe's tip there is. You know, meeting with investors, uh, obviously you want to grow the fund, you want people to invest, but we also spend a lot of time telling people why they don't want to be in this offer. Um, more of it, more of just an education because the last thing we want is somebody to come sign papers and then you know, a month, two months, six months later, go, well, uh, I don't want to be in this. So we're, we're very transparent in, in talking through the risks as well as the benefits of this type of offering and structure because, you know, put bluntly, these, these Offerings are highly illiquid. Um, it's not like a share of stock on a stock exchange where you, you click a button on Tuesday and you're out of it. So um, you need to be very, you got to let your investors know where, where these offerings work and how they work because many people just don't have experience with them. All right. Well, um, let's uh, go to questions. So Hugo asks, can you please define the operator? Sure. We look at any a person as an operator is someone who is out there looking for property, who's looking to buy property, uh, someone who is going to get a contract on property and run the day to day operations of the property or oversee them. They don't have to actually be the property manager, but they need to be able to contract the property manager. They need to be able to develop a business plan uh, and they need to be able to run a property from purchase to sale. Uh, Daniel asks, not sure if it was already mentioned, but is there a minimum unit count for multifamily? We did mention uh, the check size or uh, project size of, a, of at least, say, 5 million, probably 10 or more. Um, we do pay very close attention to price per unit. Uh, generally, we like to see within a market, we like to see price per unit to be on the say lower half of the, of the product type. Uh, we generally avoid class A product, which tends to have a higher price per unit. Oh, you guys prefer class A? We do, no, we, we prefer B and C. We, we, stand, we stay away from class A. Got it, right, right. Yeah, and that's where most of our clients are is in the class B and C space or uh, you know, trying to, they're not out trying to buy the class A properties because the cap rates are usually so low, yeah. Um, all right. And Daniel asks, is it only co-GP correct? And I think we answered that and the answer is yes. Right. Uh, you're not bringing in any of the LP money from your fund. That is That's right. There are, there are some situations where we'll come in as, a, as an LP, um, depending on terms, but, but our primary focus is co-GP. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, an anonymous attendee asks, how high of a loan can you guarantee? Well, our, our fund is $40 million, so that's the not worth component. The lender sometimes has some discretion on that. It can go higher, but that's that's a ballpark range of where, where we sit. And then Rick, Rick asks, how do you typically stack slash structure fees and promote? It's, it's deal by deal, um, but we, we would say that uh, we respect the acquisition to be an asset management fee from an operator um, and, and, uh, because these, these are fees that operators need to stay in business. They keep the lights on, frankly. Um, operators really, they make money when the property sells. They're not making money uh, from cash flow, just general nature of, of a prep. It's in there for preferred rate of return. Um, that it's it's very back and loaded. So we do respect the fee structure. As far as uh, promote, it, it's very deal by deal. Um, it's it's hard to throw out a blanket statement. Um, just just uh, to an opening question like that. But happy happy to talk through it with anybody who has specific questions. All right, and uh, let's see. 
Um, Anonymous asks again, i just curious, what are the typical returns to your LPs in your fund? What, what are you offering your investors? Um, so yeah, so as Mark mentioned, we, you know, we kind of look at these properties at the IRR uh, project level, but um, when we are negotiating on the Code GB side, the fund itself is uh, getting part of the promote income or getting all the promote income from the, the deal, the, of the underlying deal. So uh, if you look at the project level of, uh, of investment at a 15% IRR, our investors are going to make more than that project level because we're getting, we're passing through the promote income to them. So, um, you know, it obviously varies, if, you know, uh, how well the, the deal does, but it can, that promote income can add substantial amount to, to the investor IRR. So would it be fair to say if you bring in 90% of the GP equity to a deal that you're going to take 90% of that promote? Is that kind of how it works? No, it's, it's actually, it's actually less. It's more, it's more in favor of the operator than 90%. Um, and, and we do this because the operator is running this deal. And so they need to be compensated for it. Um, it doesn't do anybody any good if we attempt to try to keep all, all the profits. It just doesn't work well. Um, so we, it, it is not a 90 10. Um, but, but like, like I said, each deal, it's deal by deal. Um, so that's how we negotiate it. So, you know, I've worked with a lot of private equity companies, and one of the things that we do as a firm is we can represent, uh, you know, our clients in a transaction with a private equity company, you know, where they're setting up those JV structures, whether it be at the management level or at the LP level. Uh, most of the times, uh, we we see L, the um, the private equity coming in at the LP level. Um, and usually there's a whole slew of reports that they want and parameters that you have to meet. And uh, you have to pay close attention to that because if you fail on any of those things, then the, they can exercise takeover rights and, and kind of force you out of the deal and, and maybe strip even your uh, investors of the equity. But from what I'm hearing from you guys, it sounds like you have a much more reasonable approach. And you also understand that if the operator isn't making money, then the deal and the investors are going to suffer. And, uh, you know, all of you listeners on the call should be aware of that. And, and you should be explaining that to your investors. So if you have investors that, uh, you know, you feel that they're trying to pressure you into giving them everything and you get nothing, those aren't good investors for you. Because if you aren't making enough money to stay invested in the deal, then you're going to have to go out and get a job or, or do something else to feed your family. And then this investment is going to suffer. And that's how you explain it to investors that pressure you that way. They say, look, if I'm not making on this money on this deal, I'm not paying attention to your investment. You need me to be making money on this deal. You know? so, so that's a good way to kind of counteract that. Uh, that argument. Um, Hugo asks, as part of your vetting process, do you do anti-money money laundering uh, checks and KYC checks or bad actor checks on the operators? We do run a background check on every operator uh, that we that we do a deal with. So um, it's it's fairly comprehensive. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, uh, case by case uh, in terms of the analysis of that background check. And then about uh, kind of flipping it the other way, uh, what about when you're doing your own funds and you're you're raising money for your fund, are you doing uh, money laundering checks and uh, KYC on your investors? Yeah, we do have KYC responsibilities at the management level. So um, we are yeah, required to do, uh, you know, kind of basic AML KYC on our underlying investors as they're coming into the fund. Great. Okay. And all of you listeners should be doing that as well. Um, Hugo says, thank you. Um, <clears throat> see, uh, Luis asks, do you only invest in the lower 48? How about in Puerto Rico? Um, we could invest there. We've talked with our accountants. They said it's, it's fine. We just haven't, um, you know, one, one thing that we are concerned about, especially in the Southeast part of the country, though, of course, is, is insurance rates due to climate change and hurricane risk. So um, that those markets are, you know, somewhat highly scrutinized on our end. Um, but technically, yes, we could, we could invest in Puerto Rico. So one of our guests asked, are you interested in storage facilities? We have done some self-storage. Uh, Again, it's not a primary focus of the phone, but uh, you know, depending on the opportunity, we, we, would, we would look at it. 
Um, would you please go ahead and give us your contact inf information so anybody wants to get in touch with you? And maybe if you could also type it in the chat, that would be wonderful. Sure. The phone number is 312-863-8079. Uh, and that's a direct line. And you can email us at uh, wealthmanagement at chicagotrading.com. Our website is ctcwealthmanagement.com. Um, any one of those methods, uh, we're, we're happy to, to talk with any operator, uh, with deal or no deal in hand. Uh, we also encourage you to just reach out just to have a conversation. Just let's, let's, start, the, let's start the process. And uh, we promise we don't bite, so um, feel free. Uh, and then uh, go ahead and give me a phone number. I'll go ahead and type it in the chat right now. 312-863-8079. And we've got ctcwealthmanagement.com. And you mentioned another? Uh, the email wealthmanagement at chicagotrading.com. And tell us about Chicago Trading. What is that, that company's business? Sure, yeah. Chicago Trading Company is a, it's a global options market making firm, uh, proprietary in nature, um, really uh, trades liquidity around the globe uh, in, in the options markets primarily. Uh, it's been around since 1995, uh, you know, over 600 employees, actually 700 now, uh, offices in London, New York, Chicago, and Colorado. Uh, yeah. Very cool. All right. Um, okay, great. And let's see. Uh, Daniel asked uh, to get in touch. Uh, let's see. Um, no, we've already answered that one. Okay, you've got that information now. Um, <clears throat> Hugo, you want to re ask that question? You said I was referring to the fund also. If you could re ask that question, that would be great. Um, and uh, let's see. Do you all consider mixed use as well uh, as, you know, like multifamily mixed with retail? Would you consider that? Um, well, there are some agent requirements for to get agency debt with multifamily that it can't be uh, certain percentages of retail, but, uh, and we will accept some store level uh, ground floor retail and projects, but for the most part, uh, we want to see, you know, the bulk of the revenue uh, from that project coming from multifamily, you know, north of, north of, 85%, 90% coming from the multifamily side of the mixed use project. Well, and I know you said you would uh, co-guarantee uh, non-recourse debt. So are you only referring to agency debt or, or if, if CM, will you also co-guarantee uh, CMBS loans if they're non-recourse? We take a look at those and as well as um, local and regional banks, um, if, if that's the case. Um. <clears throat> So here's a, here's a question Keith asks. Uh, I have a deal I'm looking at that the seller would finance, but they want 20% down. I'm sure that once we have it under contract, we can find investors to fund the down payment. The seller is asking for proof of funds. Have you seen any way to address this? Um, as far as proof of funds for the 20%, is that what they're... Yeah. yeah. You know, once again, something like that, we're going to be looking at it from the perspective of how much are we investing in the project um, and, and where where we line up with that with that deal. So um, we're not gonna just offer proof of funds without having some type of arrangement lined up first. Mm -hmm. so, so you would look at the deal and if it was something you were interested in and said, yeah, this is one we'd go forward on, then you could help with that. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. All right. Good question. That was a great question, Keith. Um, okay, and then Hugo said his question was answered. Um, thanks, Hugo. Uh, Michael says, any thoughts regarding yesterday's White House statement as to possible rent control or rental cap increases and how it impacts your investment? Um, yeah, so that rent control is definitely something we we follow closely in, in all of the states. You know, there's a, that's on the agenda of a lot of states. Um, it's you know, it's an important part of the analysis. Uh, and if, if there's some stringent rent control that, that potentially go through, you know, we have to, we have to look at that from an analysis perspective. So um, it's, it is something that we follow closely. And one, another thing to add on there too, is depending on your source, there, there's a shortage of, of housing units in the United States, somewhere 
know, around 4 million housing units needed in the next 10 years or so. Uh, we do see a long-term continued demand for multifamily, and we definitely see our role as, as, a, as a group that provides a uh, safe value proposition for the tenant um, when they go and rent to the property there. Um, we, we definitely are very top of property maintenance, and, uh, and we don't we don't want to run a property that's in disarray and getting worse. Uh, so we stay very much in close contact with our operators to do the right thing. Excellent. Well, um, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. If you want to reach us, go to syndicationattorneys.com. If you click the button on schedule a call, then you're going to get some options on scheduling uh, with one of our team uh, or even a scheduling a call with me. Um, you have the contact uh, in the chat. Make sure you save the chat. If you don't know how to do that, there's uh, to the right of where you would type in your chat. There's three little dots. If you uh, click on those dots, you'll get a pop-up that says save chat and you should be able to do that. So if you wanna save uh, that contact information or if you wanna just save the actual individual uh, chat entries, there should three little dots next to each one of those that you can uh, click on and save that information. Um, we thank all of you that came today and took time out of your day to uh, come with us um, and, uh, and come see us. If you haven't subscribed to our podcast on uh, your favorite podcast platform, uh, please do so. We actually just got some statistics that said we're in the top 25% of all Buzzsprout uh, um, podcasts. And, and they're one of the, uh, that's, that's the software system that we use to uh, put our podcast out on 20 different podcast platforms. So uh, we are growing our audience and we appreciate all of you that take your time to listen. Um, this is live streaming on YouTube, YouTube. So if anybody wants to go and listen to it right after the call, again, if you felt like you missed something, it is there. And then uh, we will be putting it on the podcast platform after it's been edited. So uh, again, thank you all for your time, Mark and Joe. Thank you so much. This was really interesting. Um, you know, love your concept for your fund. I love that you guys were willing to share with our audience, some of your fundraising tips and uh, some of your experience, that's always hugely valuable for our clients and our attendees to listen to. So hope everybody has a really great day and uh, we will be talking.